Welcome to A Night for Truth, a series of conversations with Dr. Alice von Hildebrand concerning the work of her husband, Dietrich von Hildebrand. Most notably, right now, we are concentrating on his uh, marvelous and massive work, uh, Transformation in Christ. And as you can tell from the title, Transformation in Christ, this means, of course, what the church uh, very often refers to as configuration to Christ, that is, to move uh, under the influence and guidance and grace given by the Holy Spirit from the little egocentric, bound creature that I naturally am into what St. Paul calls the glorious freedom of the sons of God. And... This is a process, we might say, that requires everything of us. T.S. Eliot says in his great poem, Four Quartets, that it is a condition of complete simplicity costing not less than everything. And Dietrich von Hildebrand has, I believe, as no other author has quite done it, explored this and I should even say pursued this, and pursued it remorselessly, not in the uncharitable sense, but in the sense uh, which Scripture says of itself, that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Uh, well, here we have a uh, not one of the apostles or one of the early fathers of the church, but a man whom Pope Pius XII called a 20th century doctor of the church, Dietrich von Hildebrand, exploring these topics. And I must confess, uh, the chapter that we're speaking of right now, True Freedom, is one in which, how shall I put it, your husband steps all over my toes. <laughs> well, he's uh, been stepping uh, over my ever since I met him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you begin to mull over this topic of what is it that uh, distinguishes St. Francis from me, shall we say, just one or two very small things, of course, but uh, you realize that the ten, you begin to realize the 10,000 things which act as, as shackles or as chains, uh, to one's real freedom, being overly fastidious about other people, uh, or being everlastingly on the lookout for my rights, or am I getting the proper dignity here, or have I got my place uh, in line, and so on. I can remember in my early years as a professor, you know, you put on all your lovely uh, academic regalia for a commencement exercise and you're put at a certain place in line, and of course everybody knows there's a pecking order in the line from the uh, the young freshman junior professors back to the big uh, grand old men. Well, I was fairly toward the front of things in those days, and I have to confess, I thought, well, you know, I don't know whether this is quite up to my dignity or not, and I realized this is what we mean by a failure of charity. It's, it's, it's the, the tyranny of egocentrism. Well, Dr. Von Hildebrand, uh, this is uh, well, your I mean, husband's it's, specialty. It's, Tell uh, us about it's it. It's a, a very good introduction. You know, when I was rereading this chapter, and somehow it never made such a deep impression upon me. I read it many times, but this time I said to myself, you know, this is just an absolutely magnificent study of all the little, little, small obstacles that prevent the flow of love from reaching other people. But you don't have any difficulty with that, surely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I said to myself, well, it's a little bit in Gulliver's Travels. When Gulliver comes to the country of the Lilliputians, you recall, and, and all of a people. sudden he discovers that he's stuck and he cannot move. And there are tiny little threads 
but there are thousands of them. All these tiny little creatures have nailed his fingers and so on, and he cannot liberate himself. And I said to him, I said, that's exactly what he's telling us in the chapter on true freedom. He's going to give us a whole series of tiny little things and, oh, don't make so much fuss about this. Oh, this is unimportant. It is important because whatever prevents me from loving another person or expressing my love is simply an obstacle to my transformation in Christ. So, you know, we've mentioned disgust. Uh, you take the amazing case of St. Francis of Assisi and he meets this leper. And we all know that there's nothing more disgusting than leprosy. You know, that your whole body starts rotting and apparently, you know, the, the, the stench of it can make you faint. And he has such a feeling of disgust. And in this very moment, he begs for God's grace and embraces him. And from this moment on, he was free. And he just realized, I mean, this was a radical rupture. You know, with something which you do for someone that you love, if it is a child, if it is a husband, and so forth. But I would even know wives or husbands who have difficulties taking care of their beloved one the very moment, but they are very, very sick and not very appetizing. And this is something we must overcome out of love. Now, my husband gives a whole series of them, and each one of them I said to myself, well, be careful, this seems to be applying to you. Can no, you, you give take, us a, a little well, rundown? You know, they take, for example, something that I've suffered from a great deal in my life. Fear. Fear of poverty. Fear of lonesomeness. Fear of abandonment. Fear of uh, sickness. Fear, and you know, it can go on and on and on. And sometimes, you know, particularly during the night, which is called in the company Noxium Phantasmata, all of a sudden you realize all the things that can happen to you. But what will happen to me if I lose my husband? What will happen to me if I lose my job? What will happen to me if I get sick? What will happen to me? And then all of a sudden you start crying over yourself and you feel desperate and you say, my goodness, and you forget that God loves you. You forget that he has given you so many graces and you forget to pray and simply say, no, my Lord, take away this chalice from me or take away this cup from me. But if you send it to me, I trust that you will give me the grace and the help to do so. But, I mean, I do know that many people are just paralyzed by fear. For example, people that are hypochondriac. You know, as soon as they hear, they watch a television program and they speak about any sickness. And the next moment, they start feeling the symptoms of this sickness. And they are totally paralyzed by it. You know, hypochondria is something that makes me dreadfully self-centered. You know, how many of us have had cancer? Because all of a sudden we hear, you know, this is something which is very widespread in the United States and you've been a smoker, you're going to have cancer of the lung and so on and so on. And then people become totally imprisoned in themselves. You see, freedom, true freedom, simply means that I liberate myself from myself and then I'll be free to love other people. Or you take people that have inferiority complexes. And inferiority complexes are a widespread disease. You know, if you read modern literature, you know, actually starting, I guess, in the, the late 19th century, as opposed to the previous classical literature, you see this constant preoccupation with oneself. You know, it is a sickness of modern man that is always observing himself instead of responding to an object. I recall the last time that I saw Viktor Frankl, you know, this yeah. rather famous psychiatrist, I think he was a very great man, and I'm happy to inform you, which you probably do not know and cannot know, that my husband discovered him. He was, you know, he had published this anti-Nazi newspaper in Vienna, and he received a series of articles from young people, and there was a young article of a totally unknown young man, who was about 23 at the time, called Viktor Frankl. And my husband says, well, I mean, this is something which is truly, awfully valuable. And he published it. He had been trying to publish it, and nobody knew his name, of course, and it was turned on. I mean, all of us have been turned on innumerable times. When you start publishing, nobody knows who you are, and then he goes into the waste paper basket. And I'll tell you something very touching. My husband left Vienna the last moment. Viktor Frankl stayed and was in a concentration camp for five years with his young wife who died, his father who died, his mother who died. 
and he was convinced that he survived because he had a sense of mission, you know, namely his discovery that you must search for meaning. And if life is meaningless, there's no reason to live and you let yourself die. After the war, he published this remarkable book, uh, precisely search for meaning. Mm -hmm. He became, a, and then he was invited in the United States. He arrived in New York. One of the first things that he did was to try to locate my husband, to call him and to say, you know, ten years ago you were the first one who recognized that my work had some value. I just wanted to thank you. I thought it was yeah. a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, one of the sicknesses today, and this is why so many people go to psychiatrists. I assure you. When I started teaching in Hunter, I found out that about 75% of my students, and many of them were poor, were going to a psychiatrist because of this constant preoccupation with themselves. And one of the sicknesses today, which is extremely fashionable, are uh, inferiority complexes, mm. which simply means to say that you compare what you are to what you would like to be. You know, how many of us would like to be great beauties? which might be the, you know, the ruin of our soul. How many of us would like to be famous? How many of us would like to be the, make the headlines? How many of us, and so on and so on. And then you discover, well, you cannot quite make this. And then you fall into inferiority complexes that pitch, puts you in a constant state of cramp. For example, this is much more widespread in Europe than in the United States. You come from an extreme... But the inferiority complex? No, no, no. It's a specific oh. one that I'm going to mention now. You come from an extremely modest background. In Europe, when I was a child, I always noticed when someone came, had parents that had no education, and for some reason they made it, they will always try to cover it up and never mention their parents. In the United States, the country of self-made people, you love to say, well, my father worked on the subway in New York City, and now I'm mayor of New York. You see what I mean? That yeah. somehow, or you take Congo, I mean, his father was selling fruits and vegetables in Queens or something like that, and he would mention and say, you know, that is the American dream. In Europe, it is the very opposite. You try to hide it, you know. And, and if you come from an aristocratic background, I mean, you will constantly remind people that you come from a baron and you come from a count and so forth and so on. Now, at any rate, an inferiority, or you have bad marks in school. Mm -hmm. College, but I mean, you just about made it. And then, as soon as academics are mentioned, you get into a cramp, and you know your freedom is impeached because you fear that people might discover that you didn't do very well. You know, I mean, or you can be simply because uh, someone in your family was a very, very bad character and has gone to jail. And then, once again, if you mention family, all of a sudden. You lack freedom instead of saying, well, all right, you know, there are things, there are things happening, there are terrible things which happen in my family. But I mean, it's no reason for me to be in a cramp, to hide them, and uh, to do as if it had not existed. Another reason why people get lack freedom. You know, all of a sudden you feel that there are certain topics you cannot touch because immediately they get into a cramp. They feel that you might discover this and that about their background. Would you say that? There are two sort of parallel, if not synonymous, statements, that, uh, and I, I think uh, I probably originally got hold of this notion via reading your husband's work. Uh, namely, there is both freedom from, that is to say, these various shackles yes. that just keep me walking on eggshells my whole life. You know, what are they going to think? Or what are, are they, they going to me do? Dignity? Or, this, that, and the other thing, and I'm just, you know, life is just a tussle with, uh, with my, with ego. Uh, freedom from a and freedom to, freedom in order to yes. do so and so. I've often thought of this uh, with respect to any kind of an artist or an athlete, let's say a gymnast or a ballet dancer or a great soprano or violinist or anyone who achieves something. Um, what we're mainly conscious of when we see the ripe product, the full product, Itzhak Perlman or Ru Rudolf Nureyev or someone, um, it's a, their obedience to the rules, so to speak, has yielded this glorious freedom to play the violin or to control 
one's body and on the ballet stage or to sing this this uh, freedom to do that how has he arrived at that or he obeyed the choreographer he did what Balanchine told him to do Chuck Perlman did what his teacher told him to do and they have come through to where their freedom equals beauty equals prowess and power uh, equals joy almost for the rest of us and I think that's a, there's a wonderful analogy there with the spiritual the interior freedom that your husband is talking about that uh, having been increasingly set free from these, these shackles of my the own tiny, forging the tiny little things these that Lilliputian up. these Lilliputian yeah. shackles um, one begins to to step into that freedom which is known by your St. Francis's and others presumably Mother Teresa of Calcutta uh, when she would go on TV, uh, we know perfectly well that backstage ahead of time, she wasn't adjusting her sari and saying, oh dear, oh dear, I wonder whether this is quite fashionable she enough. She was thinking and, about herself. Uh, that's right. And I've often thought, if, if, you, if you said to a saint, uh, well now, you're a very famous saint, dear Francis, uh, tell us about yourself. <laughs> I think we'd pull a blank. I don't think he he wouldn't know what we were asking. But you know, say, just to there show, anything to say. To show you something which is so lovable in my husband, you know, he wrote these huge memoirs, you know, dedicated to me, five thousand pages, and there is a couple of pages dedicated to the very bad talks that he gave in his life. Very bad talks. Yes, he said four times in my life, I've given a talk that was so bad that it was a real flop. I wish and I had only. I wish I only had four. Yes, but what is interesting? It tells you the date. It tells you the topic. It tells you the audience, and so on and so on. You know, he just wants to acknowledge. You know, of course, he's a very great man. But simultaneously, he acknowledges the moment simply when I did not do my work properly for some reason or another. No, I assure you that 99% man intellectuals would rather die than acknowledge that once they have given a very bad talk, yeah. that was a flop. They, they'd rather die. Yeah. Or <laughs> fail to acknowledge that they, you know, they flunk a test. Yeah. You know, some people, in any field, they flunk the test very well. But afterwards, yeah. for the rest of their life, they're on the alert from fear that someone might know that yeah. they have, instead of saying, yes, I feel, you know, I myself have given some very bad talks. I mean, I'm, I'm quite conscious of it. Yeah. And probably as I'm going to continue to give some more bad talks. I don't I'm, know, but I'm some of sure. them. I'm not some, sure I believe that. Well, when you should you make an act of faith, because <laughs> I mean, I have given some very bad talks simply because mm. the topic wasn't quite my line, or because I didn't prepare myself properly, or because, mm. you know, for some other reason. But, you know, I find that so beautiful, this freedom of my husband of saying, there and there and there, I give four in my life. Mm. One is given hundreds and hundreds, so I mean, the percentage is not very high. But, I mean, this is freedom, you know, in the most beautiful sense of the term. Yeah. Or, let us take another case. Uh, you know, people, and this is something that I've noticed so many times among young people, what my husband calls the independence complex. You know, the fear yeah. of acknowledging that you have benefited from someone else. You know, for example, I know people who develop an idea and never say, that they have taken it from someone else, you know, because they simply want to see, you know, as if they were the originator of these very beautiful mm -hmm. ideas, instead of rejoicing the fact that someone else has benefited you, someone else has enriched you. Once again, in, in his memoirs, my husband says, you know, this thought is something that was given to me by my teacher so and so, and, I ben and then he developed it, but he's always giving the credit to someone else. Some people have the idea, it all comes from myself. I can do it by myself. I don't need any help. I'm independent. And if you take young people that are immature, you know, particularly in high school, when they start believing that they are mature, and my husband always says, the puberty crisis begins the very day that a young boy or girl declares that they are mature. That is a puberty crisis, you see. And then you say A, and they will do non-A. Because you said A, not at, you said non-A, they would say A. 
you know, I had a niece like that. I mean, it was absolutely a disease. And she felt that she was such a strong and powerful personality because whatever she was told, she would say the opposite. If you say God exists, well, she had to say that God did not exist. Now, afterwards, you can play the trick and so certainly play the atheist itself, and then she was going to defend God's existence just to show that she was independent. She's a slave. I'm sure you are, are aware of it, uh, as I am, that uh, this is, I think, a particularly virulent disease in academia. Of course. Where, I mean, I can't think of another field where the competition is so... Tiger -like. The rivalry, you know, I uh, was told. I was told that Wall Street is gentle by comparison, but yeah. worse than that are the artists. Oh really? Yeah. I was told that is a very worse. You know, it's a yeah. constant war with a dagger that you're trying to bring yeah. other people. But yeah. I mean, academia, it is very, very bad. That and of notion. course, yeah. and of yeah. course, I'm sorry to say, intellectual theft yeah. is something that exists. Yeah. I remember thinking. Uh, that uh, you know you read something and you think oh, wait a minute he got that from me that was my idea uh and actually it, it, it's but rather you, but amusing. you don't get but you don't get any credit for it you see I, and, I, and he didn't give me credit but then i thought well number one where do i think i got it i probably got it from reading dietrich von hildebrand or t.s Eliot. oh i got it from St. augustine or i got it from augustine. and instead of gladly acknowledging yeah. that we have received it you know the complex is i did it all by myself and I besides don't which what, what is the point anyway is it is it that somebody's name tom howard john jones bill smith that that be put forward or the, or that the truth get spoken there's a young man now who was a student of mine and he's a very good writer, and he's beginning to make a little mark in the... Uh, he's about to be received into the Catholic Church, too, this Easter. And I can see my teaching all the way through his writing, but he writes beautiful prose, and uh, it, would, it would be a horrible bondage if, if I wrote to him and said, now, David, you've got, to put, you've got to put a footnote there saying, you know, I learned this from Tom Howard... Because, number one, the point of it is that the truth keep being spoken. And number two, of course, I'd have to put the footnotes, yeah, Tom Howard, who got it from Dietrich von Hildebrand, etc., etc. Well, you see, of course, uh, truth, you cannot steal truth because it belongs to us. But, of course, you can, you can steal, um, you know, the formulation of certain ideas. You can, you can steal the structure of a book. You can steal the titles of the chapters. I mean, these are things that happen. And as a matter of fact, I just got a letter from someone I'd written a blurb uh, for someone. And then just before I left, I got a letter from someone saying, you know, you're praising the scholarly character of the book, but I mean, actually, all the quotations are taken from my dissertation. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is theft. You yeah. see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Because she got no credit for it. Yeah. And so that is the case, even though, I mean, whether it's true or not is irrelevant. The question was that it was a particular work of one particular person that you steal it. And this is something which I believe, and it is done a great deal among intellectuals. You know, oh, yes. It is. yes, I've often uh, thought if anybody was under the mistaken notion that to be literate and sophisticated and well-read and civilized, if that were the thing that made us good, then graduate professors of English or philosophy or history ought to be the most virtuous people in they the world. They should be canonized. And that, yes. <laughs> and alas, it, it doesn't work out that way. So mm -hmm. something's rotten in the state of Denmark. And it's not, it, it's not uh, just what's wrong with us cerebrally. I'm afraid, you, I'm afraid you have the same squalid egocentrism in those departments as you do in the most cut and thrust, cloak and dagger No, you see, except, I tell you, except that one is when I, you know, enter Hunter. I was very young and I was very naive and ex inexperienced. And of course, it's a bit of disillusion because, you see, this is a place which is supposed to be devoted to the pursuit and spreading of truth. And then you find out that there's meanness, that there's rivalry, that there's egotism, that there is enormous egos trying to inflate themselves. You know, very much as I say, if a priest is a bad priest, it's a more bitter disappointment that if Mr. Smith that I meet on the street is a mediocre man. You see, you expect more simply. And I simply say, if you happen to be in the academic world and you have no selfless devotion to truth, it is particularly sad. It is particularly depressing. 
it's a <clears throat> it's a a piquant irony it seems to me uh, this 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 sort of sophisticated twist on forms of egocentrism that that would seem very squalid and and yet uh, well we must uh, once again draw the uh, this section of our ongoing conversation to a reluctant close but I think it's it's clear um, to our viewers that the topics which we find opened up uh, in the work of Dietrich von Hildebrand are topics which both go deep and wide, you might say, embracing the totality of our human experience. He's come from a man who has mulled and ruminated profoundly on the human experience. So thank you once again, Dr. von Hildebrand, for being with us, and I hope the viewers will join us again for more conversations on A Night for Truth. <laughs>